Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome young Jean Lee back to the English department at Berkeley. She studied in this department as an undergraduate from 1992 to 1996 and must have liked it because she went right on to graduate school um, to do uh, graduate work in the English Renaissance and uh, actually began a dissertation on Shakespeare. She left Berkeley for the East Coast in 2000 or 2001? Uh, 2000. In 2000. And, uh, it was not very long after escaping the academic confines of Berkeley that she launched a playwriting career of her own in New York. And since 2003, she's written and directed seven plays, a remarkable body of, um, of, of dramatic work, both in terms of the writing and the directing. Uh, theater critics describe her work as provocative and irreverent and unexpected and edgy and jagged and absurd, uh, brilliant and seriously funny. She has, in short, created quite a sensation in New York theater. And her latest play, The Shipment, also got rave reviews in the national press. In the course of becoming a major American playwright and director, She's even founded her own theater company and taken her productions on both national and international tours. We're very pleased and honored to welcome young Jean Lee back to the department as a distinguished alumna. So I, I think my first question is just going to be to ask young Jean to fill out some of the story that I just gave you, and to talk especially about how she got from he here to where she is now, that is from uh, studying English literature at Berkeley to writing and directing plays in New York. Um, uh, well, as, as Kathy said, I, I went here as an undergraduate, and um, uh, I had pretty much the most perfect undergraduate experience here, you know, I, I could possibly have had. I mean, I just... Uh, you know, I was like wandering around campus today all day, just like you know, tearing because I you know love this place so much, and um, uh, and and then I stayed for graduate school, and for me, graduate school was you know the, the closest thing to hell I've ever experienced. Like I, I you know, You're it's not like, alone. <laughs> you know, like right now, like my father's dying, and I told him that like grad school was worse than this. You know, and this is this is like pretty bad, but it was just, like that's how much it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was like just, and I've tried like describing the agony to people, and you know if you just if you haven't done it, if you haven't you know gone through the process of trying to write a dissertation and you know take your orals and like jump all of these hurdles, you just don't know. You know the it's really um, you know because I'm in a line of work that's incredibly stressful. I mean it's just constant you know crazy deadlines, and you know you're always up against the wall. And I just feel like now that I've been through the stress of uh, of, of grad school and you know the, the sort of deadlines that you're up against, like I can handle any level of stress. And you know for me like New York, you know everybody said oh New York's really hard. New York is not hard <laughs> like it's <laughs> compared to this. So. We're glad to know we prepared you. Yeah, well. yeah, no, but seriously, like, my dad still has nightmares about being in boot camp in Korea, and I still have nightmares about, you know, about, about grad school. It was just, um, and, uh, and, and, and so I, and I actually, I actually didn't drop out in 2000, in 2000, 2000 I got married, and I moved to New Haven, uh, uh, and, 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 um, my my former husband was was going to law school there, so I was like trying to write my dissertation, you know, uh, like on the other side of the country, which is obviously, you know, for something that would be difficult enough if I were here, um, it was sort of, you know, inevitable that I was going to lose my mind. Um, and so I was in New Haven, and I went to see, you know, I finally went to see a therapist because I was, you know, going so crazy, and I was just so determined because it was like I, at this point I'd put in like six years of my life, you know, ten years actually if you count undergrad, you know, ten years of my life just devoted to um, this goal of you know, getting my PhD, becoming a professor, and you know, at, as grad school progressed, it was just like getting my PhD, just like get the degree and like, you know. Um, and uh, 
Uh, and so I went to a therapist, and you know, she was like, oh man, like you're a mess. Um, uh, and she said, I'm gonna ask you a question, and I want you to answer it just off the top of your head, like you know, clearly like you're, you know, you're very analytical, <laughs> and, uh, and I just need you to like answer from like the dumb part of your psyche. And so she, she said, okay, I'm gonna ask you a question, just answer from like the dumbest part of your brain. If it's nonsense words, that's fine. And so she said, you know, what do you wanna do with your life? And I said, you know, I wanna be a playwright. And it was, I had never, I'd never even considered being a playwright before ever. You know, I had no theater background or experience really. And it was, it was like saying I wanted to be an astronaut. And because I'd been studying Shakespeare, it was like especially crazy. Because it was like as if you're, you know, you study amoebas and you're like, I want to be an, no, amoebas are too, yeah. it has to be something really great. Like I'm studying, you know, <laughs> skyscrapers and I want to be a skyscraper. It was just like insane. And so I started, I started, I was so embarrassed and I just started laughing and I was like, oh, you know, like crazy. And, and you know, she was like, well, you know, you're pretty desperate. So, you know, let's let's talk about it. And you know, she uncovered this sort of uh, she she uncovered this really sort of hidden love of of theater, um, and you know, theater and and not just from a sort of academic perspective, but just from you know the idea of being backstage at a theater was so exciting to me. And just you know, actors, the idea of that. So I had always been completely in love of this idea of live theater, but I had never actually you know tried to. Tried to, tried to come into contact with it in any way because it just seemed like so far away. Um, and I, you know, I came from a really, really typical sort of, you know, Asian, Asian background, you know, where my parents like really wanted me to be like a lawyer or, you know, go to business school or something. So the fact that I, you know, studied Shakespeare was already like this huge rebellion. So I couldn't even imagine, you know, going any further than that. Um, and so I ended up just like, you know, moving to New York and... So how did you make contact? How did you first come into contact with the world of theater that you were longing for in your unconscious? Um, well, I, it's, it's actually, I, I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. Like, I didn't know who any of the, you know, Beckett was the most recent playwright I knew of, you know, and so I, I didn't have any idea what was going on, and I was in New Haven, and so I, um, I, I just did some Googling, and I found this local playwriting group that was sort of out in the middle of nowhere, you know, was in some t tiny little Little town in some like abandoned place and so I went there and it was like you know this group of sort of middle-aged locals who really were writing just the worst plays you could possibly conceive of like I remember there were you know there was like homicidal prison nurses you know like very serious you know it's it's very it's a very serious thing when prison nurses become homicidal and like you know <laughs> 9-11 plays with people manipulating like mannequins of their spouses' dead bodies and stuff. And, and, but I loved it. I mean, I didn't know any better than that, you know? So I was like, man, you know? <laughs> like, but, but it was so great and I was so into it. And, and the reason I'm telling you the story, I, I, just, yeah. I actually just wrote about somebody, uh, a, a, a paper just asked me to like tell a story about like a bad theater experience I had. So I, um, uh, so. Um, Did you write for them then in this group? Uh, I did, and I brought in a, a story, a, a play about um, the sort of drug-induced hallucinations of a character named Harelip the Albino, <laughs> and and they kicked me out. <laughs> so, so that was that was my first encounter with theater, and that I theater really, critics. yes, yes, exactly, and. Um, and I just had no idea. So finally, I was like, okay, uh, you know, let me try again. And I, I, you know, I found out that Yale had a school of drama. So I, um, so I looked up who the playwriting professors were, and I read a play by each of them. And the playwright whose play I liked the best, I just contacted him and asked him to meet with him. Um, and he, so we met, and he gave me just like a list of names, you know. And he said, you know, it sounds like you're into sort of weirder. Like if you picked me, you're into weirder stuff. So here's a list of weirdos, and you know, and like good luck. And 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 he read a play of mine, and you know, he and and uh, and so I moved to New York with the list, and I basically went around and like knocked on everybody's door, and I spent the next year. Um, I spent the next year basically like working for all of these companies and I learned how to make theater and at the end of that year I made my first show. I see. Did, so, you, did you feel like um, your training as a PhD student was a, a help or a hindrance in terms of segueing into this sort of creative work? 
Socially, it was definitely a hindrance. Um, <laughs> you know, just in the sense that you know that like I was I was trying to break into the downtown theater scene, and these are pretty mm. much like the coolest people on earth. I mean, like none of them were good in school. Like all of them were you know like the druggies in high school. Like they're just really the coolest, most punk rock people you would possibly imagine. And the fact that I was you know at the time like 27 years old, like you know dropped out of studying Shakespeare and you know grad school, like I was totally suspect and an alien. And um, so socially, it was definitely difficult. But in terms of, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think it was immensely helpful just in the sense that, you know, I think as an artist, like, the, you know, one of the best things that you can do to train to be an artist is to read. And I had read so much. You know, I'd read so many plays. You know, I think um, I, I'd read so many plays that by the time I got into my playwriting MFA program, uh, my professor he said that for the entire two years that I was there, I wasn't allowed to read anything. Because it's like I had read too much. Too much. And, mm. and, and so, like, you know, and he had me doing other things. So um, tell us the story about your first, the first play you wrote, which is The Appeal. Right. Um, because it, it, it does seem to be the one of your plays that has that whiff of the English department about it. Tell us why you, <laughs> tell us about it. What and, whiff and is how that? how you came to write it. Um, well, as I said, you know, my first year in New York, I was hanging out with all of these like insane, alcoholic, punk rock, you know, downtown theater people. And I just worshipped them. I mean, they were all descendants of, I don't know if you've heard of Richard Foreman and the Worcester Group, but they had all, you know, done these sort of uh, apprenticeships under those companies and they were just insane and um, and I wanted so badly to be one of them and so the way that I you know tried to and I was also um, I had enrolled in this MFA program and so I, I was um, uh, I had to write a play for the class and I just kept trying to write something that would like impress all of these people and sort of be like their work and everything that I did was like obviously like so derivative and horrible and um, you know, and so finally, I, 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 you know, talked to my professor, and I, you know, I said, look, you know, I can't, I can't do it. You know, I've, I've tried, I've like tried starting like 20 times. It's all crap. I'm like a horrible writer. It's just not going to work. And he said, well, you know, if you're so terrible, why don't you just write, like, go all out and just write the worst thing you can possibly imagine? You know, that all of your friends will hate the most. And so, um, you know, and so again, I was sort of like up against the wall. I was desperate. So. Uh, so I thought, like, what would be the most uncool thing I could possibly do that all of my peers would have the most contempt for? And I thought, a historical drama about the English romantic poet. <laughs> that, that would be like, you know, in experimental downtown theater, I mean, you can't get any less cool than that. And, um, you know, and so I wrote it. And, you know, and, and not only did I write that, like, I wrote it as badly as I possibly could, you know, like I, you know, and, and, you know, constantly I was sort of like pushing myself, like, oh, this isn't bad enough, I need to make it worse, you know? And so by the end, it was literally like the most shameful document I could have mm -hmm. possibly shown to anybody. And, um, you know, and at this point, I was just writing it so that I could, you know, pass my, pass my class, you know? And so I brought it into the class and I was just, you know, prepared for the worst and, um, and everybody just went crazy over it because it was it was different, and that's actually what people valued. Like they didn't want, you know, they, they didn't actually want uh, an artist who who resembled them. They wanted somebody who was doing something that they didn't recognize. And I, you know, like I, I ended up um, the play ended up getting produced, and I ended up picking from each of like the coolest companies in in New York. Like I, I basically hired everybody for the production from all of these companies, and it ended up being this really surreal experience because. Because you know, a lot of like the pain um, in the play comes from like wanting so badly to belong with these people and not fitting in. And then I had those people who who you know who I'd wanted to be so badly actually like playing those roles and like enacting all of my neuroses. So I mean, that's like such a great thing about theater. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you know right away? It was Scott and I were talking about this earlier uh, about that you wanted to direct your own plays, and was that always part of the ambition? Was not just to be the to, to be the playwright, but also to cast them and to direct them and to make them, to realize them on stage? No, I mean, not until I got to New York. And the, the companies that I was interning with, they were, um, they were sort of based on this Worcester Group model where um, it's a, collect, a collection of actors and they all write, they all direct, you know, they all, uh, they all do everything, they all perform in the works. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by, by sitting in on their rehearsals, I got to see how you do lighting design, how you do costume design, like how you direct. And, um, uh, and it's just such a, 
I mean, I really think it makes sense as a way to create theater because there's so much stuff that on the page, it, you know, it's it's like different on the page than it is per, when you know than it is when you when you perform it. And uh, if you're doing it all at the same time, then you get to actually see how how things work, you know, live, you know, as you're developing the script. So that that was the model that I sort of learned from, and it just like it just didn't make any sense to not also write and direct. And for experimental theater, it's pretty rare actually. For that for those two things to, to split because it's so performance based. Okay. I mean, maybe you could talk a bit more about some of the specific ways that you kind of uh, grow a piece uh, by kind of using the actors that you've assembled. So I thought it was really interesting in the shipment, for example, which I guess we'll be seeing a little later and talking about. But how the louder? Okay. Um, how the the second part of the play? You said basically it was that you would ask the actors what roles they really wanted to play and that they ne as black actors that they never got to play and then created a drama based on their responses. I thought that was so fascinating and, and, and quite, um, I mean, collaborative in, in the deepest sense. Um, was that, is, is that how you hope to work in the future as well? I mean, um, or is that I a mean, little weird? I mean, that was weird? a very specific part of the show. I mean, mm. the, the way that I work is, uh, like for the shipment, I basically, um, it was weird going from Berkeley to New York because in Berkeley everybody was like race, race, yay, race, like race is awesome. And then I got to New York and like nobody wanted to talk about race, you know. And uh, you know, for the for the six years that I was there, you know, pre-Obama, no, I mean, if you talked about race or brought up race, you were just like the lowest form of scum on the earth, and uh, which was weird, you know. And um, uh, and so I decided, so I kept making these race plays, you know, just to, you know, just because like I, I kept on with the strategy of like what's the most contemptible thing that I could do in these people's <laughs> eyes. Um, and, uh, and so I made like an Asian American race play and then, um, and, and, and people, and it was really weird because you know, everybody, like as soon as I started playwriting, everybody was like, do an Asian American play, do an Asian American play, we can get so much funding for that, you know? And it was, I mean, they didn't say that, but it's like, you know. Um, and uh, so people really wanted me to do that. And, um, and so I made an Asian American play that was, you know, sort of vengeful. I mean, you'll see a clip from it, but it was sort of like my vengeance, like on on all the people who wanted me to do an Asian American play, um, who then, you know, promptly wished that I had never done an Asian American play. Um, but uh, um, uh, well, should we take a look yeah, at that yeah, and then maybe talk about the? Let, let's let's look at the that clip number one. So we're very high tech today. <laughs> Oh, and, and I should just preface that this is the beginning of the show, and what happens before this is that the audience sees, uh, no, actually, you know, I should tell them a little bit about what happens. Okay. There? Okay, so basically we created this, this big set, and the audience got, like, before the show started, we didn't let them in, so they were crammed in this very small space behind the set, which I made as oppressively, stereotypically Asian as I possibly could. And the, the, and, and the idea was just to, like, cram everybody into this, like, oppressively Asian space with, like, flute music and trickling water. And, uh, and uh, you know, and they're there, like, until, like, you know, until right when the show's supposed to start. You know, and people sometimes show, like, a half an hour early. So people are, like, sometimes for half an hour, like, crammed into this, we call at the Asian Wonderland, and it was just so cheesy. And then, um, and then they walk into the space. Uh, we finally let them in, and uh, the space is just completely bare. On the outside of the set, it's like this Asian stereotypical temple with like dragon murals and stuff. And then once you get to the other side of it, it's just this sort of bare plywood box of a room. And um, and as they're sitting down and like you know getting settled in, like the lights suddenly cut out. And, um, and they hear me and some friends of mine sort of practicing to make this video of me getting hit in the face. And we're all like laughing and like the audience is laughing and it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's just really weird. And, uh, and then the video, and, th and then, you know, you listen for a while in the darkness and pretty soon you're like, oh, I want to actually see her getting hit. And then the image comes on of me getting hit and I was actually getting hit in the face. And I'd never been hit before and I was just like bawling and it's horrible, it's like horrible to watch. And so the audience at that point is like, oh my God, get me out of here. Like about 50% of the audience at that point is like, you know, wants to leave. Um, and, uh, and then, um, and then, and then uh, the, the video stops finally. And, you know, as they're getting their, their coats and stuff to get out, like this, this, this always stopped them. Have you ever noticed 
how most Asian Americans are slightly brain damaged from having grown up with Asian parents? It's like being raised by monkeys. These retarded monkeys who can barely speak English and who are too evil to understand anything besides conformity and status. Most of us hate these monkeys from an early age and try to learn how to be human from school or television. But the result is always tainted by the subtle or not so subtle retardation. Asian people from Asia are even more brain damaged, but in a different way, because they are the original monkey. <laughs> anyway, some white men who like Asian women seem to like this retarded quality as well. And sometimes the more retarded, the better. <laughs> I am so mad about all the racist things against me in this country, which is America. Like the fact that the reason why so many white men date Asian women is that they can get better looking Asian women than they can get white women because we are easier to get and have lower self-esteem. It's like going with an inferior brand so that you can afford more luxury features. <laughs> also, Asian women will date white guys who no white women would touch. But the important thing about being Korean is getting to know your roots. Because we come to this country, and we want to forget about our ancestry, but this is bad. And we have to remember that our grandfathers and grandmothers were people too, with interesting stories to tell. Which leads to a story from my grandmother, which is the story of the mudfish. In Korea, they have this weird thing where everyone turns the year older on New Year's Day. So if you're born on December 31st, you turn one on January 1st, even though you've only been alive for a day. Anyway. Each New Year's Day, my grandmother would make this special dish called Nikudaji Tong that she'd only serve once a year because it was such a pain in the ass to make. <laughs> the main ingredient of Nikudaji Tong is mudfish, which are these tiny fishes they have in Korea that live on muddy riverbanks and eat mud. Every New Year's Day, my grandmother would throw a bunch of mudfish into a bowl of brine, which would make them puke out all of their mud until they were shiny clean. Then, she would put pieces of tofu on a skillet heat it up, and throw the live mudfish onto the skillet. The mudfish would frantically burrow inside the pieces of tofu to escape the heat, and voila, stuffed tofu. Oh. <laughs> White people are so alert to any infringement on their rights. It's really funny. <laughs> and the reason why it's funny is that minorities have all the power. We can take the word racism and hurl it at people and demolish them and there's nothing you can do to stop us. I feel so much pity for you right now. You have no idea what's going on. The wiliness of the Korean is beyond anything you could ever hope to imagine. I can promise you one thing, which is that we will crush you. You may laugh now, but remember my words when you and your offspring are riding under our yoke. Let the Korean dancing begin!
Let me ask you all. <laughs> sure, I hope a lot of people have uh, questions that they'll pose later on about it. It's, it's a great opening. Um, I'm curious about the where the desire to kind of stage kind of mus uh, res wrestling match at the end of that very you know asymmetrical uh, <laughs> wrestling match, as it were, uh, came from. Because you know it seems like a lot of your work is about um, kind of turning the violence that is usually buried within people and making it theatrical. And uh, you know, there's something about that in the beginning when you have people slapping you, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a way of maybe dramatizing um, violence people do to themselves, you know, self-loathing or something. I don't know. And then this uh, this kind of fight that explodes. And the woman thinks that uh, the, the younger person thinks that she's in control of the situation. Let the dance begin, and it turns out that she's going to be its victim. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where did this come from? Like the and. And, and what, um, what do you enjoy, or what draws you to stage this kind of violence? Um, well, I mean, I think I, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't actually know how to answer that, that question because it's, it, you know, in terms of like how the shows evolve, I mean, they don't really come mm -hmm. from, uh, I mean, this show in particular didn't come from a very rational place. Like, there's one scene that I actually wish we could show uh, that that's you know more violence later, where um, it's it's you know all of those women you just see they're they're all miming these really insanely gruesome suicides to Mariah Carey's "All I Want for Christmas Is You," and there there really wasn't any sort of like logical reason to have that scene in there. It was just you know I heard the Mariah Carey like in a drugstore or something, and like the image mm -hmm. popped into my head, and then we ended up using it. So I th I mean. You know, in a way, it was sort of. I mean, the whole show is basically just playing with, you know, playing with stereotypes, and um, you know, there's no like one. Uh, there's no like sometimes the women are stereotypical, like sometimes they're not, but they're mm -hmm. always like really aggressive and really violent, mm -hmm. which was. I mean, I think I think the violence of. Um, of the Asian women sort of came from just a desire to see Asian women being really violent, you know. Mm -hmm. And even when they're killing themselves, they're definitely not victims, you know. They're mm -hmm. they're uh, they're uh, they're actually victimizing the audience more, you know, mm -hmm. just because like the way that they do it is so aggressive. Um, and yeah, I get. Well, it takes you know the words gives slapstick a whole new meaning in in, in mm -hmm. many ways, both <laughs> you start with. But the, what you start with is actually kind of seriously violent, and you know it's not as funny in, as you're describing the audience response to it. People are right, right, laughing right, at it. Right, they're not so, laughing at the video, yeah, the, the right, slapping video. Right, right. Um, so do they laugh then at this? I mean, I'm just yeah, sort of yeah, interested yeah, yeah, yeah. in, it's, it's in the like, morphing this is pretty, of the violence. I mean, the, it's pretty hard to get them out of that. I mean. It's they're so eager after the watching the video of me getting hit to like get yeah. out of that place that uh -huh. they're really they they laugh very easily I and see. they like go to a different place with this and I think you know I think I was just really just angry at you know having seen like everything having to do with Asian women always seemed to involve horrible things happening to them mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I f I wanted to sort of find a way to have them not these be these sort of passive passive see. victims yeah. of evil mm -hmm. I see yeah. does in the creation of this Play. Was there was there much collaborative work with the actors and actresses themselves? Um, yeah, there there. I mean, there. It's it's become increasingly more collaborative. Mm -hmm. But for this show, I had the structure in mind from the beginning, which was that there would be an Asian American identity show that got taken over by a white couple having a relationship drama. Right. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, so like the first half of the show is basically this Asian American show and the story of this like Asian American you know yeah. protagonist and like these three sort of you know sadistic Korean women and um, and then halfway through the play, this white couple shows up and they have this scene where they're you know having relationship problems and then. And they start sort of switching off with the with the Koreans, and it becomes sort of combative, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 in the end, they end up like eating the show. So like you know, at a certain point, like the Asian women just disappear, and it's just this white couple. It's like this interminably long, you know, like half hour scene with like the white couple just you know going through every sort of manifestation of relationship drama they can, right. um, and then and then it ends. And so it's subtitle. The subtitle actually refers to that, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not like actually the a songs subtitle. Of the dragons <laughs> flying to heaven or, um, it, well, or white it was, people it falling was, in love or something. The, 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 the <laughs> show description was a show about white people a falling in, a, a okay. show about white okay. people in love. Okay. And the reason why we came up with that was that the postcard that I had commissioned, I, I commissioned a drawing for the postcard, which was basically like the most offensive 
uh, the most of, like of every most offensive racial stereotype I could think of done in this really pretty children's book manner. So there was like you know Mount Fuji and the Great Wall of China and like cherry blossoms and like the little slant-eyed Chinamen, you know, like doing every stereotypical thing, like you know, like riding in rickshaws yeah. and like eating with chopsticks, and it was just and it was beautiful and like really cute. And um, but it was it was uh, we didn't want to just I mean there's always a problem of you know like the thing that I hate is when people just do the stereotype and then just say it's a critique. Like there's nothing, like there's, there's no way anybody could ever tell that it's a critique, but it's like just because I did it, it's a critique, uh -huh. since I'm not racist, you know, and or since I'm Asian. And so we put on the flip side that it was, uh, you know, the description of the show was a show about okay. white people in love, you know, just so that you could see that there was, you know, it wasn't just gonna be this like, you know, yay, we all get to like be racist towards Asians mm -hmm. and an Asian person is allowing us to do that mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. of thing. Right. So you've now done two race plays, mm -hmm. um, both of which involve all kinds of absurdity and the, so the, uh, the repetition of stereotypes until they start to kind of implode and, and fall apart. And this deadpan surrealist style in which you direct, write and direct all of this. And what was it like going from the, what was the transition like from going to one that was about Korean Americans to one that was about black-white relations and what, um, was Well, there that? was actually a show in between that was, um, uh, that was basically a church service, an evangelical Christian church service that was targeted towards um, atheistic liberals. And that wasn't ironic or making fun of Christianity in any way that was actually attempting to convert them. And I was like, you know, I just grew up so anti-Christian. My parents are both evangelical and I was so resistant. And I, I was really like the most resistant person I could think of. So I tried to make a show that would um, that would manage to convert me, or that would manage to, you know, so I took out all the homophobia and all of the political stuff that I couldn't deal with, and, um, and, and just kept in the parts that seemed valuable, and that seemed, you know, where, where it seemed like Christians had something going for them that I didn't, and, um, and, and so that, that was the experience. And that ended up being really collaborative with the cast, because, you know, I was constantly, <sighs> Um, using myself as a measure, like, am I convinced by this? But the cast was all like really, really atheistic. So you know, we we just kept kept honing and refining until like you know, I'm always looking for like the magic bullet that will get as many people as possible within a very uh -huh. narrow demographic. I mean, my demographic, no matter where we go in the world, is always city dwelling, college educated, like artsy fartsy. Like it's always the same people wherever mm -hmm. we go. You know, mm -hmm. so um, you know, whatever ethnicity they are, like whatever country they're from, and so you know, we we. Um, so we, you know, we made the show that attempted to like convert liberals to Christian. I mean, not really, yeah. but that made them not feel hostility. So it was like, is there some way to constantly like undercut the hostility and the creepy response? And um, well, did you end up finding the magic bullet? We did. The, that was definitely. I mean, I think that was definitely like my most successful show in, in in the sense that like we were trying to do something really hard, and you know, at the end, like. You know, that was the most popular show we've had with audiences, you know, in, in, in the sense that, you know, we had Christians come who, like, loved the show. Like, they, they said that they kept waiting to be made fun of. Um, and, you know, there were, there's all these Christian blogs now with Christians saying that they came and they were, like, waiting all the time for the other shoe to drop. And it never dropped. And there's, and there's, like, a part, there's, like, a long section where it just, like, devolves into nonsense. And the preacher's talking about, like, mummies and unicorns and, like, totally dead serious. And, you know, the Christians all got that. Nobody was like, oh, that's sacrilegious. You know, they were just like, oh, yeah, you know, like, mm -hmm. that's how it sounds sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. And so the Christians were really on board. And the, the, all of the snooty liberals were, like, so moved because you know a lot of them hadn't grown up in church backgrounds and so they weren't accustomed to like the effect that music can have on you in that space you know and the the sort of um you know, when we did these, like, there was, like, a magic bullet prayer that, that's, that's actually in there that it just, like, got everybody. And uh, um, so that was actually, yeah, that, that, that worked, like, to our, to our surprise. So do you, do you think of that as the... As the uh as the play that was really sort of audience friendly, it was not really designed to put people on the edge. Oh yeah, it was like the, it was actually like the opposite. Uh -huh. Well, in a way though, it did it did put the audience on the edge a little bit because they were wondering, mm -hmm. like, if it was gonna, they didn't know where it was going mm -hmm. ever. You know, they didn't know if it was gonna like actually turn creepily Christian or if yeah. it was gonna like nail Christians or something. So there was a little bit of an edge, but in terms of like we were we were definitely having the. I mean, because you know, doing a Christian show, like, I mean, the thing is always just to keep people from. Shutting 
shutting down. Because as soon as people can categorize something, like they instantly are just gone. You've lost right. them, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so, but that was definitely more audience friendly in the sense that we wanted to like lure and seduce people in. Okay. Then, and, and I also wanted to make a show that my mom could come see because she like, <laughs> um, yeah, she'd been begging me to like make a show without sex and profanity oh, so that she could see it. So you didn't ask her to come to see the shipment then? No, she no. can't. She can never see that show. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we ask you to talk about the shipment, maybe we should tell you what part of it we're going to oh, yeah, show because yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't know yet. Um, the clip from the shipment that we're going to show uh, is the is a, a part of the. Um, of the odyssey of the young black man mm -hmm. who uh, has the ambition to become a rap star, right? And um, this is one of the, the first half of the shipment basically picks up various uh, performance modes uh, from popular culture, the black performance modes from popular culture and renders them uh, absurd in different ways. And so this one is this long, I guess it's about it's at least half, at least a quarter of the show, something like that. Anyway, it goes it goes on for quite a long time, detailing the story of this kid who, of course, is seduced into selling drugs and ends up in prison. And uh, but nevertheless, in prison, he is um, it, he becomes a black Muslim and and he becomes a different kind of rap musician who is more politicized. And anyway, so the part we're going to show is the. Um, the part that starts when he's in prison and after he's been converted. When he's in prison? And after he's been converted, so he's about to do his little... Music video. Mu music, the prison music I think video. I probably should give it a little bit more context. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the shipment, uh, the shipment was... Um, it was an attempt to do a black identity show that, you know, I, I, and, 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 you know, the black, doing the black identity show just made doing the Asian identity show look like a piece of cake, you know, because it was like the resistance. And we started it pre-Obama, and people just did not want to talk about, um, uh, about, about racism against black people. And so um, what we ended up doing was I, I collaborated. This was my most collaborative piece. Um, uh, and um, the whole process was me basically like asking my cast you know, what were the things that they wanted to say? You know, what were the things that bothered them? You know, like, what did they want to communicate through the show? Because I don't really have a lot to say about, you know, like, you know, it, 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 that, that's where, you know, all of the sort of um, content of the show was. And so we, I ended up structuring the first half of the show, you know, as a minstrel show of sorts. Like, it starts with um, a, a dance, and then there's a stand-up act, and then there's um, a series of sketches, um, one of which you'll see, and then um, a series of sketches about the young man who becomes a drug dealer and wants to become a rapper. And then, um, and then it ends with a song. And, uh, and, um, what we were going for in the first half of the show was, you know, my performers were talking about how it was weird, like, you know, some, like they love to sing and they love to dance, but uh, one of my actors said sometimes he would be at a gig where he'd be singing and the entire audience would be white and there would be nothing wrong with what he was doing. He'd just be singing some beautiful song, but he somehow felt weird about it. Like there was something weird about like being um, a black man singing for an all white audience, you know, and they were just talking about how much it sucks that, you know, just, you know, just, you know, in the act of doing something that you love, you could feel that it was somehow like degrading or something. So the first half of the show was just about, um, you know, the different, the different sort of stereotypes of black entertainment. And, you know, again, we really didn't want to just like recreate the, the stereotype and call it a critique. So everything was really, I mean, you know, it was basically, we, we just did everything really badly. Like it wasn't, um, so like this is, you know, there's like no attempt at authenticity and they're not really actually doing the stereotype correctly. Like it's not written in slang. And, uh, you know, the, the, the image that we used was that they were wearing the stereotypes like a sort of ill-fitting paper doll costume with like just the tabs mm -hmm. holding them on. So should we see clip number two? We're actually gonna see, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, play the song later, if that's all right. Maybe oh, yeah, discuss yeah. this, discuss this. Okay. Hate white people. Why? Because they are mean. Oh. With so many white people running loose on the streets, why do we point our gun barrels at each other? I don't know. We should shoot the white people instead. 
That's a good idea. Omar, what is your greatest wish? <laughs> to be a rap star. Then you must go forth and rap about killing white people until there are no white people <coughs> left. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Fellow prisoners, I rap for you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate white people in a major way. Whitey Hunky Cracker, I wish you were dead. To get that fruity taste, I've got to shoot you in the head. Yeah! Yo, I'm a record company executive, and when we both get out of here in two months, I'm going to make you a star. You can't believe it. <laughs> Would you like your hair like this, or like this for the video? I don't know. Sashay thinks you should have your hair like this. <laughs> Who's Sashay? Who is Sashay? Sashay! Sashay is excitement. Ooh, Sashay! Sashay is adventure. Ooh! Glamour and glitter, fashion and fame. Sashay! Sashay is truly outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, Sashay! Sashay! The music's contagious. Outrageous. Sashay is my name. No one else is the same. Sashay is my name. Sashay! Oh, no, thank you. I'm married to a woman. Let me convert you. Being gay is fun. Hi, Amar. <laughs> Hi, Video Ho. Do you like my booty? <laughs> yes. Do you like my boobs? Yes. I like expensive things. <laughs> okay. I'll meet you in your trailer in 15 minutes. <sighs> okay. <laughs> That's a lot of drugs. <laughs> Why do you need so many? Because I'm addicted. Omar, get in here and do stuff to my booty. I better go. <laughs> Good luck, Omar. I really wish you'd convert in. I'm a really nice boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Desmond. If only you were here to see me now. In my fur coat, gold chains, and designer sunglasses. Do you want to say something? Or, yeah. or do you yeah. want, or? Oh, no, it's just, I, it, it's like that, that, was, that was definitely like sort of the hardest part of the show for all of us because that, that was the sort of. Um, uh, I mean, because before that scene, I mean, it's before that scene happens, it's the uh, it's this really, really confrontational um, uh, stand up routine. And then um, and then it's did you want to show the song? We can we uh, were going to show the movies. song. Yeah. Do, would you rather go to the song now? Yeah, we can we can we can skip or do to you wanna, we should do like the second half of it. It's really long. The did you want to do the whole song? <laughs> <laughs> we sort of had that uh, queued up the first part of the song. So. Oh, the first part of the song. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah that's fine. We can. Uh, so, so basically, um, the uh, um, when we did these two workshops of the of the shipment that had completely failed. They were really terrible, and and basically we were doing stuff like that through. And and the audience, the white audience, like loved it. I mean, they completely loved it. They were laughing hysterically, and it was really, um, it was really this thing where it's, they thought that they were being. It was like the kind of laughter that comes from, oh, I'm being given permission to laugh at things I'm not supposed to laugh at. And so, um, this is like the section of the show that was sort of the most volatile for mm -hmm. us because it sort of came closest mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to just like being kind of you know an offensive stereotype. Yeah. So we framed it with this really confrontational thing um, beforehand. So it's like when when we did these type of scenes before. 
before framing it with the with the really aggressive stand up thing, like yeah. the audience was just like roaring. And if you listen here, it's like a little bit more scattered uh -huh. because people got a little paranoid. And then um, and then after this section, there's a song, and um, the point of the song was that it was like really really difficult to, to do the song because we we tried to do a song where they would sing and they would you know sing beautifully and enjoy themselves, but we would strip strip the song of any kind of like. Uh, uh, of anything that could be coded as black, and um, and uh, um, and this was actually the part of the show. The song was the part of the show that weirdly made white people the angriest, um, made a lot of white people in the audience angry because they um, they they just weren't they weren't able to identify it to the to the point where it just made them uncomfortable and they felt like there was no reason for it to for it to, to be there. So why, why did you choose? How did you choose the song? And um, because we no, just let's listen to the song first, maybe. Okay. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. let's listen to the, it makes yeah. more sense for you all to know what we're talking <laughs> about. This is the song titled The Dark Center of the Universe. Yeah. By Modest Mouse, right? Disintegrate into the thin air if you'd like. I'm not the dark center of the universe like you thought. I might disintegrate into the thin air if you'd like. I'm not the dark center of the universe like you thought. Well, it took a lot of work to be the ass I am, and I'm real damn sure that anyone can equally, easily fuck you over. Well, I died saying something, but I didn't mean it. Everyone's life ends, no one ever completes it. Dry or wet ice, they both melt, and you're equally cheated. Well, it took a lot of work to be the ass I am, and I'm real damn sure that anyone can equally, easily fuck you over. Well, an endless ocean landing on an endless desert, well, it's funny as hell, but no one laughs when they get there. If you can't see the thin air, why the hell should you care? Well, maybe we could maybe we could talk a bit about the stage, the the choice of that song and the way it was done. Is what struck me was I found it incredibly effective just watching the DVD because the 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 lyrics of the song are are filled with such pathos. I could disappear into thin air if you'd like. Uh, you know, I'm not the dark center of the universe that you you know thought I was, um, and yet they sing it with this kind of blank faced way. Um, without using the kind of you know gospel intonations or melisma that you might associate with being transported by emotion, and I was wondering how you came uh, upon that, you know, how it ended up uh, sounding the way it did. Well, actually, the video quality is really bad, so it looks like they're mm. blank faced, but they're mm. actually just like looking at every single person in the audience. So, um, and uh, you know, they just they just didn't want it was they just didn't want uh, they wanted to see if it was possible to, they just wanted to see what would happen um, if, if they were singing without anything, you know, without any of that, anything that could be coded as, as black. And it was really, really hard because, you know, they're all, uh, you know, they all have like a background in like gospel singing and they're sort of naturally, they're like a certain way that they want to move and they wanted to sing that felt natural to them, but they like really didn't want to do that. So we just kept, kept, you know, stripping it away and stripping it away until there was like, you know, there was none of that. Um, and it was just a way to like distance, you know, to, to, you know, we were constantly just trying to like distance ourselves from the stereotype so that it was sort of half, half a stereotype and, mm -hmm. and half not so that you weren't exactly sure what you were watching. Because we didn't want to show something that was like overtly offensive, you know, or something that was like clearly very PC. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like so much of your theater, I mean, it's really wonderful to me how it kind of shifts very, uh, you know, you get it kind of, you develop maybe a set of expectations and then those are unsettled. So, you know, for, to begin with that, the, what we saw with the, um, the kind of minstrel-like cliches 
and that you're kind of wondering, how am I supposed to, am I supposed to laugh or not? They seem so absurd. And then we move into this other uh, moment, which to me is just like, I, I, I am being confronted uh, by those singers, and I am being forced not to think of the absurdity of it, uh, but the, the suffering that goes from being forced to play those absurdities on stage and mm -hmm. have people think that that's who you really are, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and uh, I guess one, this is more a general question about your playwriting is, you know, how do you know when to shift uh, mood? Or is that just sort of like part of how you write that you're kind of, you start in a certain groove and then you're like, oh, now I got to do, to you know, to mudfish and tofu to kind of shake things up. I mean, I think in a way that's where the critical background helps. Mm. You know, the background in literary criticism because it's like you're so, um, you know, I, I was just trained to be so hyper alert to my responses to everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when I'm sitting and I'm watching, you know, as soon as I start to feel like, oh God, like I know where this is going, like that's when I have to flip it. So it's really, it's kind of a fun job because you just sit there and every time you start getting bored, you change it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of experimental theater, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, before we turn this uh, uh, out to the audience for questions, I would like to look at one other um, moment when you're going for, you're trying to empty things of racial content, or you're, you're trying to move out of the register of racial performance into something unmarked in, in racial terms, and that is to the end of the shipment. OK. Um, first of all, I do want to find out, what about the title of the shipment? Why, why is it called The Shipment? Um, it was, I mean, I just thought it was really, uh, like, evocative. It was evocative, obviously, of, like, you know, uh, of, of, of slavery, you know, okay. people coming over yeah. on ships. But it was also just the idea of, you know, people being kidnapped and sort of brought over as a shipment. Like, in the same way that, like, a, you know, a shipment, you'd get a shipment of books from Amazon. Like, they were a product. And they, fun you know, they functioned within right. the economy. And that sort of, like, was, you know, to me, like, the root of, okay. the, pro of the problem. Okay. Um, and, and, and so this, what you're about to see is a clip from the second half of the show, which was basically like I asked the cast, like, what are the roles you've always, you know, dreamed of playing that you never get to play um, because you're always asked to be like drug dealers and, you know, prostitutes. And, um, and so, they, so they all wrote down like what they, you know, the roles that they wanted to play. And I said, well, what kind of play do you want it to be? And they said they wanted it to be a totally straight naturalistic play, which I'd never done before. But, you know, I, I, you know, I, the, the, the rule I had set for myself was I had to do whatever they wanted. So this was um, my first attempt at naturalism. OK, so we're going to pick it up actually in the middle of the game uh, of the library game and just go that last bit. Oh, OK. OK. okay. Do, do we need to explain what the library so do you, game yeah, is? Yeah, do, do you want to do you want to explain what the library game is, or just oh, a little bit of what's gone game. on before? Well, you know, they're they're basically like these sort of like upper middle class. Um, upper middle class people in their 20s and 30s and they're just kind of hanging out and uh, you know one and the guy who's hosting the party you know reveals at a certain po point that it's his birthday and then he like comes in with a birthday cake and then he like reveals at another point that he's uh, that he's uh, um, uh, poisoned everybody's drinks and you know it's just this this sort of like black comedy and um, uh, and at the end, of, you know, at the end of the show, he's convinced everybody that he's semi-convinced everybody that he's poisoned them. So like the ambulance is on the way, and everybody's like incredibly, you know, upset. And then he comes back in and he says he was just kidding, you know. And then and everybody like furious at him, and he starts having like a nervous breakdown and talking about his, you know, his isolation, you know, like how he hasn't been in a relationship in so long, and you know how he doesn't like his job and wants to make a living sitting at home doing whatever he wants, and you know, just like the sort of litany of complaints that I hear from you know myself and like everybody I know, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then, um, you know, and so, and, and he's just drinking and he's a mess. And finally, like, one of them calls for an ambulance to come get him to be on suicide watch because he's, you know, he's also threatening to kill himself. And um, while they're all waiting for the ambulance to come, he, there's been mention of a game called Library, which is, I mean, I, I, I've been go. I don't know if you guys know about these artists' colonies, but you know, like there are two major ones are McDowell and Yaddo that I went to, and there were all these like always these parlor games that people would play, and one of them was called Library, where you would um, somebody would pick a book off the shelf and tell everybody the title and the author's name and the genre, and then everybody in the circle has to write a sentence pretending that it's a sentence from the book, and um, and. Uh, um, uh, and then, like whoever, and, and then people vote on which sentence is the actual sentence from the book. And this is like a very typical game that um, that we would play at these artist colonies. And um, 
And this scene is actually, I mean, I've never actually revealed this to anybody, but this actually happened to me. Um, at, at, so, the, so the end of the play is, uh, is, is, is actually something that happened. So. Oh, oh, and so he manages to convince everybody to play this game with him while they're waiting for the ambulance to come get him. Can we get these lights on? They're going to take you to the hospital for 24 hour observation, Thomas. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you guys doing? Are you playing library? I found one. Hey, seriously? It's a non fiction book called Black Magic by Yvonne Patricia Chirot. There's a chapter in this book called Negro Superstitions which is made up of a list of black superstitions. You guys have to come up with the first superstition in the list. Your sentences should begin, the Negro believes. Omar, you're not gonna blog about this, are you? <laughs> Is everyone finished? him up and down with a raw beef tongue. <laughs> the Negro believes that a Negro's hands and feet are white because the moon done touched them in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I have to say, I'm really uncomfortable with all of this. <laughs> I just don't feel like we would be doing this if there was a black person in the room. I guess that would depend on what kind of black person it was. <laughs> <laughs> so that was actually like a joke ending that I just like brought in one day as a joke to like sort of play a trick on the you know to to have fun with the actors and they loved it so much that they never let me get rid of it. <laughs> I can see why. I can see why. Um, are are you happy with that? Um, do you think it really changes the? meaning of what you were doing there? I, um, was, what is your I was really resistant to it at first because I felt like, okay, here we just made this like, you know, this this play that was made, you know, for you know, for my actors, the play that they wanted to be in that didn't have anything like shady or stereotypical in it at all. And um, and you know, in the end by saying that none of them were black, 
it it felt to me sort of like we were saying, oh, it's you know, it's it. I don't know that it somehow took that away from them, and uh, and and they were really adamant that that wasn't the case, and they ended up being right because what ends up ends up ha happening is that you know you, you for a lot of people it's like there's a million things that happen in your head once you hear that they're not they're like you know then you start having thoughts like oh like you know white and black people alike they were like I could tell they weren't acting like black people and then it's like well what does that mean you know like what you, what does that mean like you know and 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 just the question of like what it means to act like a white person or what you know I can't tell you the number of um, black women who came up to me after the show and said black people would never play library you know like and they, they, they were just like that is not a game we would play and I was like well you know I'm sure that there are black people who do play library you know so it's like you know it's really it, it was it was it ended up being like a much more complicated ending than I, than I thought um, yeah, so I, I always feel like that last line, especially that depends on what kind of black people they were, I forget, or something like that. Yeah. It's almost like a Zen Cohen, and you really start playing with it. Like, oh, what exactly does that mean? You know, what are we, uh, you know, are we wishing that there would be a black person who could play library to a book of black magic or Negro superstition, or, or is it about you know the, the 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 fact that there's so many obviously different kinds of black people in the world, and that this is what the the plague wants to break us out of stereotypes and to you know. Think, think outside of them, um, but is that is that a line that just came to you and just you wrote it down and then uh, it worked? Yeah, it was like a whim, you know. Yeah. That that was sort of like you know, and the, and the actors they never knew they would be performing the scene and they would mm -hmm. never know what was going to happen, mm -hmm. you know. So like suddenly it would be like suicide, suddenly it would be birthday. So mm -hmm. they were always sort of like it was really cool to see them actually. It was yeah. very like Mike Mike Nichols, not Mike Nichols, Mike Lee, uh -huh. you know, where yeah. you know okay. they were mm -hmm. constantly. Right. Um, surprise, and then you know that moment where they all realized that you know none of them were black was really like kind of kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Well, it does lead to this immediate revision because there's some way in which you, you know, you're watching this as a scene in a black bourgeois life, right? And then all of a sudden, it's just a bourgeois life. You know, but and then, you're, but then you know, and, but, and you're so surprised but also, at the at the fact that they're is a difference in your mind. But just because but just because they say that none of them are black. Yeah. I mean, what does that even mean? It's like a play. You yeah. just saw them they are black and they were playing those characters, yeah, but you know, they're so actors. it's like, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, so the other thing that that hits you is just yeah. you know, it's just that. Oh, of course this is theater. I mean, it's the first thing you think is, "Oh, yeah. God, I forgot all about that." Yeah. You know, why should, why do they have to, why do the why are the characters supposed to be black just because the actors are black? Kind of Kind of question that immediately comes up for you, right? Mm -hmm. So well, and the beauty. Of, I mean, we are we're literary critics, so we can't help but interpret it. Uh, but I just think the beauty of using library as a game is that it's a game that's all about impersonation, and you're trying to impersonate the author of that book. So I think it's a it's little it's tied together very w complexly and. Uh, and everybody and, and, always assumes they were supposed to be white, but actually they were all supposed to be Asian. Yes. I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So you are reconciled to your ending now. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm definitely glad that I listened to them. Well, I'd like to uh, see who in the audience would like to ask some questions at this point. Yes. I'm interested um, in collaborating with the cast to make this play um, and having done a play about Korean identity politics, did you ever, or Korean identity and how they explode, perhaps, um, did you ever uh, encounter with the cast a sense of, uh, even though you had done the same type of play on your um, own history, racially speaking, did you ever find that they felt that you didn't deserve to be the director? Um, I mean, it was just so clear. I mean, I was definitely, that was like actually my biggest concern going in. And uh, it ended up being the least of a problem just because like I didn't really come in with an agenda. You know, it was, basic, it was basically like you come in with a bunch of actors and you're like, well, what, what kind of show do you want to make? And so it was almost like I was in service to them in a way that, that so it was never like, uh, you know, and, and also, um, 
they were familiar with my work, and so I think they, you know, it, it was never it was never a case where I was sort of trying to speak for black people or anything, you know, anything like that. It was just from you know from day one, I was like, you know, I'm Asian. It's dodgy, you know. It's something, you know, admittedly dodgy, like it's cultural appropriation. You know, it's like you know I'm taking you know resources from somebody, you know. And and another really shady thing that people almost never talk about is that you know. Uh, this show was like a huge hit. And the question of would it have been such a huge hit in New York if I had been black? You know, and uh, you know, so there there are lots of like there are lots of like issues like that. But in terms of like the black cast members and black audience members, they I mean they really like they just judged everything by the product, like by the end result. And they didn't like there was never anybody who cared that that um, that that I was Asian. I mean, there have been a few people who uh, who have said, you know, like I think she's exploiting black people, but um, you know, and like you know, I, I don't know, like if it's you know, like like I, there's never been like any further explanation than that. But you know, it's definitely something that's that's there. But it was never a problem directly with the actors or with um, audience members. Well, you know, we were so scared because the postcard I described, like Asian Americans hated that postcard and they were like boycotting the show and like the Asian American Arts Alliance like wouldn't have anything to do with it and they wouldn't email for it. And so we were like, oh man, like the show's really gonna, we're gonna get picketed by Asian Americans. And, um, and the postcard, like people, there was like so much controversy <laughs> over that. And then when the actual show happened, like we never, uh, like we, we just never got any, um, you know, if there were Asian Americans who were offended, like they definitely never, you know, every, every person that I ever spoke to or, you know, like, or read a blog of or anything, like they were very, I mean, because like I'm very, you know, at, at heart, I'm fundamentally incredibly PC. Um, and so it's like the place that I'm coming from is just not, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, you know, there's definitely like a lot of self-hatred and a lot of sketchy stuff mixed in there, you know, but like fundamentally it's not like I, you know, hate Asians and like, you know, want to harm them. So I think that sort of comes through in the show and we never, we had one family walk out in like Minneapolis, I think, or it would, maybe it was Columbus, Ohio or something. There was like one family that walked out pretty early on, but I think it was probably like the profanity. Yes. Um, I'm I'm trying to write a tragedy. It's it's my my dissertation that I never finished was on King Lear actually, and so it's 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 called an adaptation of King Lear. But you know, for all I know, it may just be like the title King Lear and then have nothing to do with it. But it's basically an attempt to see if you know, in the same way that you know, I tried to make a church service that 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 moved you know the that that moved liberal atheists and, and made it like a black identity show that like moved all of these like really anti identity politics people in New York. It's, it's an attempt to, you know, make a tragedy that, that actually, you know, functions like a tragedy and like, you know, puts you, you know, has that sort of effect on people who have just become so sort of numbed to, um, you know, numbed to like images of horrible things happening. And you know, like like all the other projects, I don't actually know if it's if it's possible to pull off. So we'll see what happens. And you, and you have something else that you're uh, that you've just Film. been signed up for. Is that oh, not, not to talk about? Oh no, no. <laughs> I, I just I just got my first movie deal. So we'll um, I'm I'm. I'm I'm thinking about making a, a a leap into writing and directing for film instead, just because it's like I worked for two years on the shipment and like several thousand people got to see it, you know. So it's it's you know it's it, the idea of like reaching a broader audience definitely um, definitely appeals. But it's like you know it's my first time ever doing it and I don't know what I'm doing, so I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, there was a hand back here before. You know, they won't bring me, I'm dying, we're dying. Like, oh my God, for the, for the Asian, for Songs of the Dragons, the Asian American show, we were all just dying to go to Korea. And they won't bring me because it's so expensive to bring somebody from America. So that they're, if they're gonna bring somebody from America, they want somebody who looks like they're from a foreign, a different country. <laughs> and that's, it's literally, that's what it is. It's like so much money that they want somebody with like a different, you know, who looks different from them. So it's been a real struggle, like getting over there. Yeah. 
maybe you can do some slight projections so to keep the English but you know. Yeah, we always have subtitles. Yeah. So it's uh yeah. <laughs> It's Los Angeles and, and Asia. Like we can, uh, Japan, we're making some inroads, but Korea and Los Angeles, those are like the two places that just, and it's all white presenters. Like it's, you know, that um, in, in Los Angeles who are just like, so. Yes. Yeah, you just mentioned that you worked two years on the shipment with all these actors. It must cost a lot of money. How do you manage? And then you had a fairly short run in a small theater. How do you manage economically? Um, it's all, uh, it's all, it's almost all European money. Yeah, we just do a ton of, of international touring. And in Europe, they actually, like, it's weird when European, the, the presenters from these major European theaters come to New York, they don't go to anything Broadway or off Broadway. They, like, they just come and, like, you know, because it's, like, the kind of theater that's, like, so marginalized in the U.S. that I do is in Europe, like, their main kind of theater that they like. So, um, so we're basically bankrolled, bankrolled by Europe and by private foundations. But the, you know, everybody's suffering now with the economy, including, you know, a lot of countries in Europe, so yeah, it's it's going to be a challenge. But you are taking the shipment. Yeah, yeah, the ch shipment's it's touring everywhere. Here. Yeah. Back here, um, and, and then when Peter. You first went to New York. When you wanted to be a playwright, you said you interned at a couple of different like companies. What were you doing? Um, you know, cleaning bathrooms. You know, like really, like all of the garbage work that you do as an intern. I was like 27, and I, you know, was like a Shakespeare scholar. You know, and it was really, really sort of degrading and terrible. But um, you know, and I did that for a year. But it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was just every most boring task you could possibly think of. There's lots of databases in nonprofits, so there's a lot of like updating databases for hours and hours and stuff like that. And then how did you make the well, I mean, the, the sort of payoff from getting doing all that horrible crap work is that you, you get to sit in on rehearsals. And so that's basically how I learned how to do everything, was just like by watching people do it. Peter. Uh, I suspect you explained your motivation for doing the church service, but I didn't quite get it. You said you, that you were quite alienated from your parents' Christianity, but you were also writing the play that your mother could watch. I was very intrigued by this, and I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more of what made that play happen. Were you commissioned to do it, or was it your idea? No, I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, it was basically, um, you know, like my, my, my approach is always to, you know, most of my shows are directed towards myself in an antagonistic way, you know, so whatever sort of like really narrow-minded views I have, like the, the shows are sort of geared towards sort of exploding all of my own ideas. So um, I just noticed, like one day I was sitting around with a bunch of friends and we were like making fun of Christians, you know, and, you know, and we were just sitting around and just saying these like horrible things and, you know, it, and, and when I walked away from the conversation, I, I, you know, I just realized like, oh my God, like we just sounded you know as bad as like anybody you know it's like everything that we were accusing the Christians of being we were like personifying that in that moment you know like you know stereotyping and like you know just you know the hatred and and, and um, you know and and uh, you know the standard line was like you know Christians are like evil morons who are ruining the country you know that was what people were saying for like a long time you know during the during uh, right but 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 at the same time it's like my parents are Christians and they're neither evil nor morons and they have a lot of stuff more together than like my friends or I do you know and so it's like people who have a spirituality in their lives you know that 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 spirituality I wanted to like look at the aspects of it that 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 were valuable and that were sort of fulfilling something that was missing in my own life, um, and so that was sort of the challenge to try to you know to try to kick myself in the ass because it's like complacency is the thing that I hate the most, um, and I think that's another thing I probably got from grad school is you know just sort of this. Uh, you know, this, this idea that you're supposed to question and challenge everything, you know, and you're not supposed to just sit there and think, you know, everything that I, everything that I believe is, you know, the only, the only truth. Um, yes. Um, and 
I was just curious um, if after having written the play and performed it, you came away with a, um, a spirituality difference or a, a way of having spirituality and all of the sort of liberal things that were seem to have been preventing you and me from having it before. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, the whole, the whole cast actually, like we met, we, we took the show to Minneapolis this past January and it had been a year since we'd done it in New York and like all of us, the show had like changed all of our lives. Like everybody went in these completely different directions, you know, just, uh, and you know, people were praying, you know, like praying is like the new thing now. Like people, you know, it's like you don't even necessarily like believe in God in this like objective way, but it's like, you know, I pray now. Um, and yeah, so it, it definitely has changed me. Yes. Where did you get your MFA from, and did you feel like it was a valuable experience in terms of your writing? And um, because you're writing such experimental work, was that looked down upon in the program? Like, were they very focused on creating an air of like um, similarity in the writing of the students? Oh, I mean, I didn't go to like a normal MFA program. I went to Brooklyn College, which is run by this guy named Mac Wellman, who's basically a huge weirdo. And it's not, you know, it's like you don't learn anything about, you know, playwriting structure. I mean, it's just not a proper, it's not a proper program. But what he does is he tailors, he tailors everything towards each particular, each specific student. Like it's very small. And um, for me, it was like immensely valuable, but it wasn't really representative of other, other programs in the, in the country. But yeah, Mac Wellman at Brooklyn College, definitely like terrific if you're, you know, if you have weird leanings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a theory of why um, Amer theater in America is so bizarre? Like what the difference is between the European and the American? Because I was thinking, for example, I wonder if it would have been hell if we still taught theater in the English department, if we hadn't marginalized well, I mean, I think I think basically the it's it's economic. Like, I mean, I think that theater is very um, you know in the U.S. we have pretty much like the least experimental theater in in the world. It's like the most conservative, and I think part of it is just because you know. For, for the majority of theaters in the country, uh, audience members are uh, like 60 and older, and ticket prices run from like 500 to 300 dollars. You know, so it's like you know, it, so we're all, um, and, and you know, and so the theater is is very geared towards them and um, and towards that particular audience and. Um, uh, you know, once that generation is gone, I don't. We don't really know what's going to happen. You know, and it's 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 definitely. Um, you know, like artistic directors through the country. I mean, I used to work for an organization where they would like bring together all the major artistic directors from around the country, and they would sit around and they would like talk. They would sit around and whine basically, and all of them said the same thing, which is that they wanted to bring in new work. They wanted to bring in you know more exper experimental writing, but they they said their audiences just wouldn't come, and they're like the theaters are dependent on the subscriber base, which are the sixty and older like upper middle class people who who keep them afloat. So it's kind of a it's it's you know as you know as the story goes it's this sort of vicious vicious cycle and also there's the competition with television and movies and a, the direction a lot of playwrights are going is instead of instead of sort of embracing what's unique about theater they're trying more and more to like emulate what they grew up watching you know in television and movies and you just you, you just can't you know theater has its own strengths you know but you can't you can't make a television show, put a television show, you know, on a stage that's going to be as good as the television show. One last question. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is too late to say yes, but do you think the performance aspect is so tied in with your work that you could never really see people reading your text or seeing like a collection of the plays just printed out? Um, well, actually, um, you know, that, that actually is true for a lot of experimental theater. Um, it's very, it's almost like anti-literary, but um, uh, it's, it's in, a, in a way, like, I've sort of really pushed the, um, uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm much more text oriented um, than than any of my friends, and um, and so like in the in the plays, it's like I've I've just put a huge am amount of effort into making them readable, so that like all of the stuff that's visual is all sort of described, and um, and I basically stole that from Richard Foreman, who who makes these like insane shows with like almost no dialogue. It's like you look at his scripts; they're like ten pages long, but his stage directions are so detailed, and so they really give you a sense of like what's happening and he puts so much energy into that so I've sort of followed his model and there's actually um, a collection of all of my plays minus the shipment that's going to be published um, in in a couple of months and you can buy it on Amazon um, or you're you know probably not your local bookstore unfortunately <laughs> yeah. okay well thank you very much oh, thank you thank you all so much <laughs>